Hello, I, I can't possibly <laughs> come up to that wonderful introduction, um, but I'll do my uh, best. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, uh, be here. I've long heard about the Toronto's high school and the interesting mix of uh, people and uh, professional perspectives you have. So it's a, a, a great honor to be able to come and speak here. Um, At this particular historical moment, we're taking part in an extraordinary sea change in how information science, libraries, archives, and all the information-related disciplines are viewed. Each week, it seems we learn of a new information discipline. Uh, knowledge management. Is that the same as information management? Uh, bioinformatics. Uh, not the same as biomedical informatics. Digital humanities or was that humanities informatics, and so on. There's a lot of uncertainty and confusion now, as well as a lot of creative ferment going into the creation of new information professions. We need to be formulating a conception of the professions that makes sense out of the ferment, one that rationalizes and clarifies just what these fields are, including where the existing information professions play a role in this new landscape. After all, we don't want someone else setting our agenda. Proactive is the name of the game. So I'm going to be saying some things today um, for what it's worth as my uh, ideas on, on this subject. In my 1999 article, The Invisible Substrate of Information Science, I argued that information science needs to be seen as a different type of um, uh, you know, I thought something went wrong there. What, that's killed my, it's killed some of my um, slides. Let me, um, I, I, when I was sitting down there, I thought, um, where's my slide set? Uh, do we have technical support in the room? <laughs> Now, I think it killed, okay. I think it killed the first, okay, no, well, that's the first screen, though. That I, I don't understand, no, is that the, the next one? Did it come in somehow after all? Maybe it got blocked, yeah, so that's okay. So, yeah, all right. It was somehow three blanks got inserted, I think. That must be what happened. Okay. Um, so I argued that the typical academic um, disciplines, uh, normally uh, we can think of them as being on a spectrum um, in this manner, where the, uh, going to the arts, the humanities, the social sciences, and the natural sciences, and mathematics. Um, and I, I think this is a common way it's thought of. I would argue, however, that there are some fields that cut across this spectrum. They deal with every traditional subject matter, but do so from a particular perspective. These fields organize themselves around some particular social purpose or interest, which then becomes the lens through which the subject fields, such as literature, geology, and so on, are regarded. There are both theoretical and research questions to study, uh, and practical professional matters to address, I call these fields meta-disciplines. And three prime examples of these are the information disciplines, communication and journalism, and education. Each deals with knowledge in all the conventional fields of the academic spectrum, but does so from a particular orientation or position that is needed to accomplish the work and theorizing of its area. Educators work on the theory and practice of teaching and learning across all subject domains. Communication researchers study the transmission of messages and their impacts in various contexts. Um, and communication practitioners, namely journalists, learn to identify topics of interest, 
sleuth her news and shape and present a story. The information disciplines all deal with the collection, organization, retrieval, and presentation of information in various contexts. Okay, thank you. Uh, there we go. All right. Be careful about this. Yes, you did mention a button. I, I may have accidentally touched it. So the information disciplines deal with all the usual things that we hear about here in, in programs like this, the collection, organization, retrieval, and presentation of information in various contexts and on various subject matters. That social purpose shapes all the activities of the information disciplines. It's the lens through which the subject content of traditional disciplines is viewed. And in all three of these example areas that I gave of education, communication, and information disciplines. The content of the conventional disciplines is being shaped and molded for a societal purpose through different types of professional activities involving the manipulation and transmission of knowledge. I think it's important to see the fields this way um, because the meta disciplines do not obviously fit into that conventional spectrum that I had up there in the way that biochemistry fits between biology and chemistry, for example. People don't know where to place this and consequently tend to be dismissive. We represent a dimension of uh, scholarship and, and professional focus that just isn't in most people's consciousness. So, for example, we have all heard the scathing dismissals of education courses in universities as being content-free. Some of us may have heard that about the information disciplines as well. Because we're taking that meta-perspective, it's one that's invisible to most people. We haven't thought about it. Um, this leads to our fields, I think, being rather seriously misunderstood by many in society, including highly educated people. Some of the confusion comes out in discussions about interdisciplinarity. If you're studying art information, it does not mean that your work is interdisciplinary in the conventional sense, as in a blend between biology and chemistry to create biochemical research. Art is the subject matter being managed, but art information work does not blend art research and information research in, in any conventional sense of interdisciplinarity. The information research is always at a meta level. For instance, we study how art historians go about their work in order to make better information systems for them. We do not research historical questions in art. I raise these examples because I think all these disciplines are misunderstood because of their meta-disciplinary character. That is outside of the worldview of the content disciplines per se. Uh, for the most part, the content of education courses does not consist of the subject matter the teachers teach per se. It does some, but not entirely. Rather, it concerns the meta questions of how to teach the subject matter. Likewise, you don't enter an elder to learn how to select, organize, store, retrieve information, and so on. Now, where do um, new, informations, uh, new uh, information disciplines arise? I think the fundamental uh, engine of development originally is generally need. So if you, the first people who became conscious of the need to store and manage archival materials were usually historians. Um, whereas the first people who realized they needed to have much more sophisticated ways of managing radiological images were physicians. So you're going to find that the theory and practice of archival research is more influenced by a humanities perspective, while the radiological informatics comes at it from a more technical um, uh, perspective that fits the kind of cognitive style and, and research paradigm of medicine. So these fields often develop out of these. I think a lot of the early theory about library and information science developed out of the humanities. And so, for instance, uh, the first rules about cataloging were much more thorough and careful in understanding of the needs of humanities scholars than they were of the needs of science and engineering 
um, to science, uh, scientists and engineers, and I learned that when I used to teach uh, science and engineering literature. Um, the, the cataloging rules are, are a poor, in the early days, I think they're much improved now, but they were a poor match for science needs because most of the people who originated those rules had a humanities background. So there's always some origin in the, the current existing fields that leads to a new discipline arising. And we see this happening with a lot of the, um, the, these new fields that are being talked about. Um, I have here an example of um, uh, arraying the spectrum. These were the ten areas that we covered in the Encyclopedia of Library and Information Sciences. And um, I arrayed them on that traditional content spectrum, not because they solely deal with those areas, but because they often originated there and still their research and thinking tends to have an orientation associated with the arts or the social behavior sciences or more mathematical approaches. But I think the important thing to remember is though that they start with that origin, but they develop into much more general disciplines, just as librarianship applies perfectly well to work in science libraries, for example. Um, Likewise, their uh, museum studies theory may have a strong humanities tradition, but there are science museums, and the applications need to be developed that are suitable for science museums. So I think historically, what tends to happen is a, a field arises uh, in a particular area, but then kind of generalizes, because the work is inherently more generalizable. It does, you know, most of the processes and theories and practices that we learn about are applicable across many areas with special applications, perhaps suitably in different areas. So it's, there's a complex relationship between those traditional, uh, uh, the traditional disciplines and these various information fields that develop out of them. I think one of the things that has led to misunderstanding or siloing between different uh, domains is that they do have these different historical traditions. They've developed often their own specific uh, paradigm and worldview that doesn't mesh perfectly with that of the others, um, so that there's been this separation across the information domains. And I'm by no means suggesting that these should all be unified in one big mega information discipline. Rather, I'm suggesting that they recognize the commonalities while respecting the unique differences in these uh, different fields. Because each of these traditions brings some special, valuable insight to the problems that we're concerned with. And that mustn't be lost. I think that's important. Now, um, one of the things we've realized in developing the topics is that though we have this spectrum here and many of the entries in the uh, development of the encyclopedia are in the middle of that spectrum, sort of social and behavioral sciences, there's still a sense in which there's this classic C.P. Snow distinction between the humanities and the sciences. And um, and that came out in various of the entries that people wrote for the encyclopedia. Some of them were going completely from a scientific or technical perspective, and others brought a very humanistic and discursive uh, discussion to their uh, topics. So I made the distinction that you can see across the top here between, the, on, on the one end, the disciplines of the cultural record being the more humanistically oriented ones, and on the other end, the sciences of information. But as you can see, they overlap, and much of the work in the social sciences often partakes of a more scientific or a more humanistic uh, approach to the, the topics of interest. Now, after a bit, um, we developed subfields and subdisciplines um, within all of these areas. 
and just crammed a whole bunch of them in here on, on, into one image. And this certainly doesn't cover everything imaginable, but it covers a lot of the stuff that were covered in the encyclopedia and shows the great range of areas of work that are relevant in the information disciplines. This incidentally is one reason why I, I, I'm not pushing for a single mega discipline because um, uh, no one is trying to get sociologists and anthropologists and psychologists to become one field called social science. You know, they're, they bring such different perspectives, they study different phenomena, they have different histories, <coughs> they're huge fields. Well, I think a lot of these are huge fields as well. And um, we just haven't fully recognized how rich and extensive the disciplines of information will become as the 21st century progresses. I think we're just kind of in on the ground floor in, in that regard. <coughs> Now let's take a still more fundamental look at what the information professions are. I, I've written a lot about the nature of information and won't try to go through all of that or persuade you of my perspective on it. But I'll try to touch briefly on some things that I think are applicable to this question of how we define the information disciplines. Um, a man by the name of Susantha Kunitalaki has written um, about um, what he calls three information flow lineages through the history of life on Earth. Talks about the genetic, the neurocultural, and the exosomatic. He emphasizes the sense in which each of these channels both stores and communicates to a later time the information it contains. Since the beginning of life on Earth, the genetic line, that is the DNA and the genome of plants and animals, has carried its generation's information from one generation to the next. And that information, in fact, as we're learning more and more about DNA, reflects the entire history of life on Earth that is stored in the DNA with some of these little pockets of now defunct bits of DNA, but that nonetheless say something about the earlier developments and um, dead ends of various um, uh, genetic lines that were, that, uh, were taken. So encoded genetic material is a form of information storage, not only of information needed currently for the maintenance of the animal, but also of the genetic history of the species. So the first of the Talaki's lineages is genetic information. His second is what he calls the neural cultural line. Through history, the more developed the brains and memories of animals became, the more possibilities there were for information to be stored, used, and passed on during the lifetime of the animals. Mother tigers teach their young how to hunt. Drawing on her neural information stores in her brain, the mother tiger hunts with the cub, and the cub learns and stores in its brain the methods of hunting, thus carrying this knowledge forward another generation. With the coming of modern humans, and especially with the development of language, it became possible to store neurologically and pass on culturally large amounts of very specific information to the next generation, and so on down through many generations. Some scientists believe that the um, biblical story of Noah and the flood dates to an actual flood that occurred in Eurasia during the Ice Ages, as the Ice Age receded. One generation told the next generation over hundreds and thousands of years, and the story still comes to us so long after the event. That's information flow through the neurocultural channel. Gunatalaki's third channel is a more recent one, and begins when human beings figured out how to store information exosomatically, that is, outside the body. He calls this the exosomatic flow line, the channel begins with drawings and carvings in rocks, and once writing was developed, exploded in many forms, from cuneiform writing in clay to Chinese characters in ink. In the prior oral age, humanity's total store of knowledge necessarily consisted of that which could be held in one or a few human brains in any uh, community or culture. 
Memorization was the chief means of retaining knowledge, and knowledge could be passed on from one person to another only in the actual presence of the other person, living being to living being. But once human beings found a way to record information in more or less permanent form outside the body, then that information could be retained for indefinitely many future generations. The person sending the information and the person receiving it did not have to be. Information was no longer limited in quantity to what a single individual could learn and memorize. Stores of that exosomatic information could build up so that human beings could consult and use the expertise of countless other human beings. The storage and management of exosomatic information was one of the major con contributors to the exponential growth of human knowledge and power over nature in the last several thousand years. For each of Gunatalaki's channels, I've identified, described, and labeled. Um, here's another, here's the reference to the Gunatalaki. Um, I've labeled different categories of information. <coughs> We've got Gunatalaki's three basic ones, the genetic, neurocultural, and exosomatic. Um, I'm going to focus specifically on the exosomatic because I think that's the domain of the information disciplines. And we can make a distinction between recorded information and embedded information. Um, Recorded information is communicatory information in durable form, while embedded information is the environmental impact, including the creation and leaving behind of artifacts and other objects. I mean, the building that we are standing in is a kind of embedded information because it reflects its structure and it reflects knowledge of a certain kind of architectural and engineering capabilities. People didn't have 500 years ago. They couldn't have built a building like this. Um, and at the same time, when we just look at the building, we don't know what the justification was. We don't know the expense. We, the building, in quotes, communicates something to us. But a building, per se, is not usually a primary channel of information uh, transmission. That would be recorded information. So embedded information occurs in many different um, parts of our lives and is a huge part of the world that, that we are uh, living in. Um, I've added a, a fourth lineage here of residue, which contains trace information um, there comes a time when people or civilizations are done with their books or objects. These are then thrown away, buried, or lost. They deteriorate ultimately to the point where they have blended back with the earth, dust to dust, as the saying goes. But during that time when they are lost to current use, but still have not disintegrated totally, they contain trace information. This form of information is of obvious importance to museum and other information professions. And we saw this recently with this spectacular discovery of, um, what is it? Um, I can't remember the famous Greek or who had written stuff on a, a um, uh, palimpsest that was cleaned off and they saw the writing that was underneath it and um, discovered that recorded information passed on. So that's an example of, of um, what was on the way to, it was residue and on the way to just going back to dust, but didn't quite make it before we humans discovered its, its content. As information professionals, we're interested in all these forms of information because we need to understand the role of information throughout human life. I'd argue, however, that in the heart of the information disciplines is exosomatic information, the external stores of information. What unites all of these professions um, is that they manage the record of our culture for all of its uses, from entertainment and education to preservation for future generations. 
even the bioinformatic databases that store the DNA information of species and animals and plants are a part of our culture in this broad sense that is stored in some recorded form. Um, I'm using culture in the sense of, of all we've created as a species, as many peoples and many individuals. It's our entire heritage. You might compare this to what J.M. Balkan called the cultural software of a society. In the information disciplines, we manage the physical form of the cultural software of humanity. And remember, when I say physical, I include digital because uh, digital is physical. It has a real material existence. Um, uh, it's not uh, in the heavens. <laughs> I think we do see it. <clears throat> this is one important place where we see distinctions between uh, different fields. Uh, communication research focuses on what I have called expressed information here, non-durable uh, communication, with the emphasis on the process and effects of communication, while in the information professions, the emphasis on the exosomatic stores of information. Um, <clears throat> likewise, Museum studies um, uh, and certain other uh, areas have a particular interest in trace information. So these differences in forms mark out some differences across the information professions. <clears throat> now, um, in a very artificial way, we can uh, separate out what I'm calling the universe of documentation from the universe of living. <laughs> and um, this is clearly very artificial because um, uh, information is embedded in our lives uh, to a very great extent. But I think it's also important for those of us in this, these information disciplines to separate, to recognize that we're studying a different universe that has its own characteristics. Um, and there are many interesting features about that, that universe of all of that information. And while in practice, in life, it's completely integrated in a way that most people don't even notice, nonetheless, there is a science and a scholarship of studying these information forms, which is very much in its early stages. I think we have a lot more to develop in our thinking about this. So, <coughs> for example, in her office with a patient, the physician uh, reviews an x-ray image and talks with the patient. She draws on her memory to identify a drug to prescribe. Then she pulls down a medical reference book and determines the amount of medication to prescribe that she writes in the patient's record. Now, for the physician and the patient, what's important is the medical situation and whether they will succeed in resolving it. Will the prescribed drug cure the patient's problem? The physician and the patient are concerned with the diagnostic situation. We in the information disciplines, on the other hand, are concerned with the information and documentation in this situation. How shall we store and retrieve the patient's record? How can that patient's record be integrated with the other information that the physician needs to bring to bear to optimize um, her treatment? How will the results of diagnostic tests be kept and communicated? I remember uh, a year or so ago, I had to hand carry a CD of a medical test from one doctor's office to another. And I thought, this in the 21st century? Um, how shall we store and retrieve the patient's record? How best to design the information system interface to enable the physician to use her medical IT software easily? Does she have the best reference book for her purposes? Even when we study the interpersonal situation between the two people, we're interested in its impact on the success of information transfer. That's what the research focus is in that situation. We are not sociologists studying the role of medical professionals in society, nor are we physicians concerned with the quality of her diagnosis. Rather, we are information people. We observe the information transfer in this situation 
and work to store safely the private medical information and retrieve the relevant factual information that pertains to it. So, um, the, um, uh, this world down here, the bottom, the universe of living, is where we all live most of the time. And all this stuff that's in the upper part is tucked in and embedded and integrated within that world of living. But somebody needs to make a science out of that universe of documentation, and that's our job. So what can we say to sort out the uh, disciplinary uh, confusion? First, I want to say a little something about a distinction between um, the terms discipline and profession, because I think that sometimes gets uh, confused as well. All professions, from medicine to accounting to clinical psychology to horticulture, are mixtures of theory and practice. If the job is so simple, that it consists of a series of steps that you carry out one after the other. In other words, if a job is algorithmic, then it is not a profession. All professions require the mastery of a body of general theory and understanding, which the practitioner then applies selectively and creatively as needed to a series of real-world problems. The application of the general knowledge requires judgment and experience to do well. That's the essence of a profession. Um, some of that theory and research tackles questions of general academic interest related to the important issues in the profession. For example, information studies and information science. We've got a lot of research on information seeking behavior. Uh, studying how people go about finding information has taught us surprising, uh, some surprising and counterintuitive things about people and information. Applying what we learn from this research to practice enables reference librarians to provide better service to clients. At the same time, the growth and understanding about people and information that is produced in the, by the information-seeking research also contributes to the social sciences generally, and other academic fields uh, can benefit from our research. So every profession is substantial enough in the world problems in the area of its professional expertise. Thus, every profession has both academic disciplinary aspects and professional practice aspects. So to some extent, but not entirely, discipline and profession overlap in meaning. As a rule, when I'm emphasizing the academic theoretical aspects of the fields, I use the term discipline. And when I emphasize the practice aspects, I use the term profession. But because theory and practice are so closely linked, uh, we wanted to be sure to address both of these in developing the content of the encyclopedia uh, and considering how to handle the relationship between discipline and profession was one of the important issues in the encyclopedia's design. Again, these are the, the 10 areas that I had listed earlier. But we also had to identify categories or types of um, topics to be covered. I, I, I could uh, go on for a long time about how um, complicated it can be to develop and make decisions about what is and isn't going to be in an encyclopedia. Um, but after the, this represents a lot more work than it looks. These things look sort of semi-obvious, but believe me, it was the end result of a lot of, oh, did I touch some button again? <sighs> uh, it was the end result of a lot of work, and these were the broad topical areas, and I have some handouts that I'll make available here uh, for anybody who wants them on, um, that contain particularly the topical contents list, which shows this sort of the underlying intellectual organization of the encyclopedia. So these were the main areas within which, across these disciplines, because we didn't want to silo the disciplines, across the disciplines, that we would find um, uh, entries. And um, furthermore, furthermore, excuse matters wrong there, but it needs to be bumped over, but um, lo and behold, after all of this work, when we looked at these things, they actually fit Rangan Athens 
uh, personality, matter, energy, space, and time, which are, you know, his argument was that all classifications need to address these. And, and I, by this point, I think I have to agree with Langenhaf. <laughs> so. <coughs> Now, here, <coughs> um, when I got into this question of then what are the fundamental to the information professions, it seems to me that we could call these major facets that are pretty commonly appearing in uh, discussions of what the professions cover. We have various services and functions. Um, uh, I have examples of these institutions, policy and management, IT, and then the subject information, the history of all of these, and the geographic distribution of these, because there's a, a difference between how libraries are handled in Europe and how they are here, and so on. So these are some of the services and functions up there on the left, libraries, archives, and museums, the classic uh, established institutions, different kinds of management, and then all kinds of subject matter, including pulp and porn, that's all recorded information. And it's all that, that in some way or another, needs to be addressed by people um, in our field. <coughs> now, one thing I want to point out is that um, that I think we don't think about enough when it comes to talking about uh, information disciplines is that the three big institutional disciplines, librarianship, archival science, uh, museum studies, these were all shaped in the 19th and 20th century around a physical institution that stored physical objects. And, um, we take for granted now so much that you know there are billions and billions of, of uh, websites and so on that, and pages that Google covers. We're just completely used to these gigantic quantities which are possible with digitized information. But in earlier days, storing those physical objects was a non-trivial problem. And if there's a lot of research that shows that the number of new titles published, the number of new journals started, the number of new indexes started, and so on, have been doubling since the beginning of moving type. And for different uh, media, you have different doubling rates. Um, uh, some of them are 12 years or 15, and others are 20. But let's just say, for simplicity's sake, that books, the number of titles, not just books, uh, physical volumes published, the number of titles ever published in books. Let's say they double once every 20 years. And so in 1450, we start with the Gutenberg Bible. We've got one uh, title. 20 years later, we now have two titles. 20 years after that, we have four, then eight, and so on. So that in the first century after the development of movable type and printing, we have a grand total of 63 titles, roughly, ever published by this doubling principle. Okay, so that goes from one book to a shelf of books in a whole century. That I think we can manage, okay? But this is one of those curves, exponential curves work this way. They build slowly at first, you know, two, four, six, eight, 16, you know, 32. And then we get more and more. So when you're up at the level of uh, uh, 250,000 titles ever published, doubling to 500,000 titles ever published, doubling to a million titles ever published, well, this is what the library world was going through in the 19th and early to mid 20th century. The, the, the biggest challenge, and I would argue the reason librarianship professionalized in the late 19th century in the first place, was because the number of books being collected were getting to a size that it required professional management. You just, you know, it was one thing to have a, a little library of Congress with 20,000 volumes in it at the beginning of the 18th century and to be getting up into multi-millions by the turn of the, into the 20th century. 
And during much of the 20th century, an academic librarian would consider his or her principal job to be to get the new library building. You know, I, when I was younger, that was what it was all about because the resources were growing at such a pace that you had to scramble to keep up with them. And during much of the mid 20th century, one new big library building after another was being built, that that's where the focus had to be because if you were going to be a good research library, you had to have these research resources. Well, eventually it reached the point where you know, the next library building up, the next doubling, would have to be five blocks long by five blocks. It just would be too big. It wasn't practical. I think at that point, we sort of had necessity mothering invention, and we got into digitized um, information. So because that was just becoming physically impossible to maintain in the old um, physical form. But I would argue that the, um, the, the fields that developed in the 19th and early 20th century, library science, archival science, museum studies, these developed around that physical institution for the simple reason that that physical storage was the primary challenge that people were encountering at that point. Now, in the 21st century, there are new fields coming online where the physical storage challenge isn't so serious and it's not any longer so focused on a, a particular kind of building as being sort of the center of the, the uh, thinking in the field. So we get others such as um, uh, um, Let me bump past this one and go back to it. We get um, others such as, to say, what I would argue is happening now is not so much the physical institution is defining these new information disciplines that are coming online, but rather these major facets, people discover the issues in their area and they invent names for their field that represent one or two or three of these facets. So we have medical informatics that emphasizes the information technology and the subject information of medicine. We have art libraries. That draws on the old institutional thing plus the subject matter. Enterprise ontologies. We get business with a function of doing the classification and organization. Um, here are still more museum informatics, Latin American libraries, if someone is studying that area, then that combines geography and the institutions. Knowledge management is one that's quite intensely focused on the knowledge and the issues of where the stuff is stored is not so much of a problem um, uh, anymore because of digitization. It's much more a question of optimizing the functionality of the organization. And so knowledge management becomes an emphasis. So I think the, 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 these different areas of information get picked up on by different disciplinary interests. And they pick the name that fits that interest. But I would argue that they all can fall into this broader rubric of what are the principal dimensions or facets of the information disciplines. Now, um, one of the things, um, let me go back to the services and functions here. Um, one of the interesting things was that we saw the parallels between the different fields. Um, in librarianship, we talk about catalog, in libraries, we talk about information seeking behavior, in museums, it is visitor studies. Um, and there are a number of these parallels from one um, field to another. And some folks have responded when I talk about these kinds of functions, and those are just examples trying to draw from several different areas. These services and functions, some people say, oh, well, those are not going to be needed anymore because we've got everything automated. We've got um, content management systems, and you just dump all your content into it, like into a pot of soup, and you let it mix around, 
and you let our search algorithm search on it, and voila, you have everything you need to know. Um, I would argue that while we have a lot of powerful technology that we didn't used to have, that it's still the case that information needs tending. And just because it's digitized doesn't mean it doesn't mean tending. It's still the product of human beings, and human beings have to be able to utilize it. And that means organizing and structuring it by whatever technology or human practices you use that make it useful um, subsequently. So whatever name you might give to it, I think we're going to find, after the, the uh, romantic uh, blush of being excited about new technologies fades a little bit, I think we're going to find we still need to tend to information if we want to make it available for humanity. And that's what these professions do. Now, one last point of how can we communicate our expertise to society, because as I've noted before, I think we were grossly misunderstood. It's important to remember how wacko people in the 19th century thought the early social sciences were. You know, psychology, this goofy guy, Freud, with these shocking theories, and these other folks, you know, doing this how can you do statistical analysis of, of uh, social processes and so on? This, this was just weird. And serious universities didn't bring these on um, until often well into the 20th century. We take them so for granted now, we don't realize that these are actually pretty new on the scene. And I would argue that that's what's going on in the 20th century, you know, I, I was asked when I was in library school, how come you need to get two years of education in order to learn to stamp books? You know, and that, that concept is still out there among many people. Why can't we make all information free? Well, maybe because it needs tending and it takes work to make it actually usable and accessible. And that should be a social process that gets valued in the economic uh, uh, calculations of people. So how do we uh, communicate that expertise? Um, one of the things I find, and you probably do too, is particularly maddening, is that um, uh, I think it's not an exaggeration to say that the larger society is engaged in a process of obliteration of library-related professions, or at least the knowledge, the official connection of the knowledge to the disciplines. The perennial processes, activities, and objects of our field are being renamed um, while pretending that these new names have nothing to do with our field. Classification becomes ontologies and taxonomy, because it's more legitimate if classification is drawn from uh, the world of biology than it is if it's drawn from our field. Collection management becomes curation. And library science is being compared to buggy whip manufacturing or home economics. And there's not a little gender bias in there, which we could have several more talks on. Um, the irony is, of course, that most of these activities are still needed in this new information world. The world doesn't need buggy whips anymore, but it sure needs information collection, management, and access provision. Burdened by outrageous stereotypes of librarians with buttons at the back of the head, and usually with abysmal ignorance about library work, these new discoverers of the exciting world of information naturally assume that no one has thought about these things before. Certainly no fields with as long and rich a history as librarianship or bibliography. By the way, even the history of the book that was a required course in my library program in 1966 has now been reinvented as a new field, but with the same name. And nobody in that field cites any of the earlier history of the book literature. They're completely oblivious to it. Um, so I, I get mad about these things. <laughs> um, 
Now, and, and perhaps it's worse in my case because I'm currently living in the San Francisco Bay Area and there everything is about Silicon Valley and um, everything is being, uh, you know, all new and the fact that actually, for example, Lockheed Martin was the uh, source of online database searching. Like I saw the early prototypes of this in 1972 um, you know, the Bay Area has a respectable history in um, the information fields and, and um, uh, companies and so on. But um, nonetheless, this just romance with this new technology seems to be uh, producing a kind of unconscious obliteration of anybody who knew anything about this before. I think we have to fight back actively. We can't assume that eventually the world at large will get it. So how can we fight? Well, I would say three things. I think first we need to take a hard look at our own assumptions and habits. We do have to recast our field for this new era, including dropping parts of the old paradigm that are no longer needed or relevant. I reflect with sadness sometimes on some of the things that I used to teach students in the 1970s and 80s that are no longer relevant. That wonderful expertise I developed is completely irrelevant on some things now. Um, and um, I, I think one thing that we need to think about doing is unhooking the field from the physical library. Um, we still, there's tremendous value in having physical libraries, don't get me wrong. I, I think we need to push that as a place for people to go and experience <coughs> certain community and other uh, uh, feelings and experiences. But at the same time, as long as we think of our field as radiating out from the physical library, then uh, digital information uh, inter information services that we provide to people at home and so on are always going to come second. And I would argue I think we're already pretty much to a place where if, if we hold just to the physical library as the center of our uh, professional universe, we're going to be um, behind the times. Instead, I would argue that we should think of offering the physical library as one of our many cool services and make choices about where will we have a building so that we can achieve these social purposes and where won't we and you know in terms of allocating resources how do we allocate resources for different um, purposes and um, uh, again I repeat I think having the physical library is wonderful and important and I am not in any way suggesting abandoning that. But I think we also need to, you know, like this old line about medicine isn't called hospital science and education isn't called school science, so why is library science called library science? You know, it's, it, we do need to think about the discipline and the profession and think of library buildings as one of the places that we practice that discipline and profession and make choices about the selection and design and so on of those physical buildings for the purposes that are appropriate in the age of Twitter and Facebook and so on. Okay, so that would be step number one. Second, I think we need to unite with other um, information disciplines and um, again, get more recognition you know, if there, I, I don't know the figures, but let's say there's a half a million librarians in this country. Well, if you added all of those 10 disciplines together, maybe there's 5 million. Um, and numbers matter. You know, that gives, so some sense of working with other information disciplines, um, uh, I, I think is an appropriate and helpful thing. Then finally, we need to market this vision like crazy. And the marketing needs to be sophisticated and done by marketing experts, not on the cheap by those of us who don't know marketing. Marketing is a sophisticated professional skill that is generally not taught in our field. This, of all things, is not something to be done through bake sale methods. 
This is about the survival of what is of value in the information professions and ensuring that our work is incorporated into this larger new information world and recognized in that world, not just taken and renamed. The marketing deserves a serious investment in professional marketing expertise. So in sum, we need to shake up the old paradigm in relation to the realities and recast what we uh, think about what we do, join with other information professions to promote the information professions, and then market the concept of information professional like crazy. general understanding of the commonalities across these different jobs. Okay.